Hey there. In this video, I'm going to show you how to expose and color grade S-Log3 in your Sony camera. Now, first of all, huge disclaimer, there are lots of ways to do all this kind of stuff, but what I'm going to do is show you what I use most of the time to give you a starting place that you can take and use and then experiment and get better yourself. Now, there are basically two different situations that I think of when I talk about exposing and grading S-Log3. You have a situation like this where I'm outside using natural light, kind of a run and gun situation, can't really control the lighting, and then a situation where you're maybe in a studio or you're doing an interview or something like that where you have controlled lighting. So I'm gonna go over both of those situations. First of all, I wanna talk about camera settings. So let's head inside and I'll take care of that. Let's talk about settings. I have two cameras here that'll sort of cover everything. We have the a7 IV, which will work very similarly to the a7S III, and we have the FX30 here, which will work very similarly to the FX3. Couple things in here to set up log shoot properly and also set up your zebras properly, and I wanna go through them so that no matter which camera you're working on, you'll have it set up properly. So we got the a7 IV here, and let's make sure we're shooting in log. <laughs> so one thing you can do is press the function button, and if you see the PP8 here, that stands for picture profile, you can go in there and select log. If it's not in your function menu, let me show you where it is in the, in the main menu. So if we go over here to the exposure tab, and we go to color tone and picture profile, you can select the different picture profiles. Now you can set any of the picture profiles to S-Log3 you want, but it comes out of the box as PP8. So if we press the right button here, you can see we have S-Log3, sgamut3.cine, which is exactly what you're looking for. So we're gonna go back here and select PP8. Now, if we go here, there's a few different options in terms of image quality, and you can use any of these options here. I generally shoot in SI 4K or HS 4K, uh, depending on what you're trying to do and you know how your computer can handle it. But one thing you wanna do is if you look in here at your movie settings, there's only one option for 24P uh, in SI 4K, but you wanna make sure that you're shooting in 10-bit 422, so that's gonna be really important to get the best possible image. Now, in terms of exposure, there's a couple things we have to set, and that's gonna be the zebras and also the gamma display assist. So let's start with the zebras. So if we go down to exposure and we go to zebra display, what we need to do is we need to set our zebra display to a certain value. And this for S-Log3 is gonna be 41%. So if you're shooting S-Log3, you wanna get 41% on your gray card, right? Like So card like this, <laughs> very inexpensive. You should definitely pick one of these up, link in description. Uh, this The reason why it's 18% has to do with like paint, reflectivity of light and stuff, but middle gray is sort of what you're aiming at for 41%. Now on the camera, like the cameras like the a7 IV and the a7S III, it's always 41%, even if you have the gamma display assist turned on or off. Now I'll talk about it. It's a little bit different in the FX30 and the FX3. So what we wanna do is set this to 41, and I like plus or minus one because that'll give me a really accurate reading for the zebras. So 41% for the zebra level, and we can turn the zebras on and off here. We can also, I have it set to be in the function menu, so we can turn the zebras on and off there as well. One thing I wanna make sure you turn on if you're using cameras like the a7 IV or the a7S III is the gamma display assist. And what this does is it adds some contrast and saturation to the image that you see on the back of your, back of your screen. It doesn't bake it into the image and it doesn't change your zebra values, but you should have it on because it does help. So let me show you how to turn this on. So if we press the menu button and we go all the way down to the uh, the suitcase here, and we go down to display options. You wanna make sure your gamma display assist is turned on, and I leave it on auto. Auto just uh, will make it pick the right settings for which log uh, profile you're in. But make sure you have that turned on and that'll help you. But I just wanna point out that this does not, as I said, bake it into the image that's recorded and it doesn't affect the histogram and the zebras and stuff like that. Now let's talk about the FX30, which is similar to the FX3. So the first thing we have to do is make sure we have log shooting turned on. So we press the menu button and we go to the main menu here and we go to the second page. You'll see the log shooting settings here. So if we select that, we have options of flexible ISO, CI quick or Cine EI. I recommend for most situations that you shoot in flexible ISO or Cine EI. If you're curious about Cine EI, I made a very detailed video to learn everything about it, how to shoot with it, how it works. I'll leave that video linked down below. But for right now, let's just shoot in flexible ISO. It doesn't matter, you'll get the same image in the camera at, in flexible ISO and Cine EI if you shoot at the base ISO of 800. So we have that set up. And there's one thing I wanna point out here, and it's different from the other cameras like the a7 IV and the a7S III, is that unlike gamma display assist, which does not affect the exposure that you see in the camera in terms of 
histogram and zebras and stuff like that, if you turn the display light on and off on the camera, it will actually change the exposure and stuff like that. So you have to be careful if you have the LUT turned on or off. So over here on the first page of the, the main menu here, you could see you have the ability to turn the LUT on or off. So, and I use the S709 LUT, which is the basic Sony conversion to Rec. 709. Now keep in mind here, if you have the LUT turned off, it's still 41%, like I said before on the gray card, but if you turn the LUT on, you will have to make sure that you set the zebras to 45%. So 41% LUT off, 45% LUT on. With all this in mind, let's go out and start shooting. So we'll start with the outdoor example first. And before I get into techniques for getting proper exposure, we have to first speak generally about exposure. So you wanna pick your shutter speed to generally be double your frame rate. So for example, I'm shooting in 24 frames a second, so my shutter speed will be one over 50. If you're shooting at 30 frames a second, one over 60. 60 frames a second, one over 125, et cetera. The next thing is you wanna lock in your ISO at the base ISO in S-Log3 in your camera. So for most Sony cameras, it's gonna be either 640 or 800, depending on which camera you're shooting on and which mode you're in. So right now, I'm shooting on a 7 IV in S-Log3, so the base ISO is 800. So you don't wanna change your shutter speed or your ISO. So there are, there are three ways you can control the exposure in your camera. You can adjust the aperture of the lens, you can change the ND filter on the front, either adjusting it up or down or taking it on or off. And then the lighting. Well, we're outside, so you can't really <laughs> control the lighting. So what you wanna do here is use the aperture and the ND filter to get proper exposure. Now, the general approach here is that I wanna make sure I don't overexpose the image because what'll happen is if you clip your highlights, which is when you overexpose the image so much that the highlights become too much and it loses the information, you won't be able to recover that in post. Now, I usually say that you know, one of the things that makes your images look more sort of amateur or more like DSLR-like is blowing out highlights. And, you know, this isn't like for every situation. There are some situations where getting the subject lit is probably more important, but I'm speaking very generally here. You just don't want to clip your highlights. And that's sort of the approach here is I'll try to expose as high as I can without clipping my highlights. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do here. So again, aperture and ND. So the first thing you wanna do is pick your aperture that you wanna shoot at. So right now I'm shooting at f2.8. You know, you're gonna decide on what aperture you want based on the depth of field that you want and then adjust the, um, the ND filter. Now, if you are shooting wide open at like 1.4 and it's super bright outside, you're gonna need a much stronger ND filter. So I like a one to five stop ND filter, which is what I'm using right now. And I'll leave that one down below. It's my favorite. Uh, and so you have, there's a limit to how much, you know, you, how, much, how dark of an image you can get with certain ND filters based on the aperture, all that kind of stuff. So now take a look here at, the, at my screen. You can see what's going on here. And sorry if I'm looking up, that's where the monitor is. You can see all my settings here. And one thing I wanna point out is this thing right here, the exposure meter, stop using this. I don't use this anymore. This thing is just the camera taking a guess at what's going on in the image and giving you a number. You need to actually look at what's going on in the image and use the tools that are in your camera. So you can also see that this image looks really flat. There's not much contrast or saturation. That's because it's showing me the S-Log3 image. Now, if you're using the screen on your camera, using the Gamma Display Assist or the LUT turned on, depending on which camera you're on, you'll get a you know more Rec. 709 looking image, which helps. That being said, I need to use the histogram, which you can't see. So I'm gonna change the display settings on the back of my camera so I see the histogram. So this guy right here, this is the histogram. This is what we're gonna to use to get proper exposure. Let me explain how this works. So on the left-hand side are your shadows. On the right-hand side are your highlights. And you can see that our image is kind of in the middle. This is perfect. We're not losing information uh, on the shadows or the highlights. And so we're gonna use this tool here to get our proper exposure. So as I said, you want to pick your aperture. So whatever aperture you wanna be at, let's say we wanna be at f2.8. And then we're gonna adjust our ND filter so that we make sure we don't clip our highlights. And let me show you what that looks like. So I'm changing the ND filter on the front of the lens right now. I'm making it brighter, less ND. And you can see that the histogram starts to shift to the right and then it starts to bunch up and shoot up. So when you have a situation like this, you can see the image is way overexposed. But what's happening here is that you're clipping your highlights. I'm losing all the information in the sky and you won't be able to recover that in post. So what you need to do is bring the exposure up as much as you can and then start bringing it down until you, the highlights are not clipped, like about there. And then I go a, a little bit further, usually in like another third or two thirds of a stop, which you can't really judge with the histogram, but you expose as high as you can and then back it down. That way you're getting as much information as possible without clipping the highlights. That being said, let's talk about the other direction. So if I make it as dark as possible and then stop down the lens, let's say you can see here, as I stop down the lens, the image gets darker and darker and darker. 
And what's going on here is that you can see on the histogram that it's bunching up on the left-hand side. This is what's known as crushing your blacks. And basically we're losing information in the shadows and you don't wanna do that either. So like I said before, pick the aperture that you want. Let's say we wanna be at F4. Then I'm gonna open up the ND filter till it bunches up and then back it down and go a little bit further to be safe. So that's how you get proper exposure using uh, your aperture and your ND outside using the histogram. So let's go inside and talk about how to get proper exposure in a controlled lighting situation. All right, so I have to actually film the back of the screen here because the zebras don't get exported over HDMI. Anyways, I have the gray card set up where I'll be sitting, which I'll be the subject of, of this shot here. And so I just have to pin it up. But usually you can have the subject just hold it or you can clamp it or whatever. So the first thing I do is set the white balance. So a lot of different ways to get to white balance, but I have it in my function menu here. So if we go over to the white balance, we're gonna go down to the custom white balance, which is, you can set three different ones. We go over to set, and then we move the box to where our gray card is, hit the okay button, and now we have a custom white balance set up. Looking good. Now let's set our exposure. So we're not gonna be using an ND filter most of the time inside, so we're gonna control the exposure with the aperture and the lighting. So let's say I wanna shoot at f2.8, which is what's going on here. So let's turn our zebras on, and I have that in the function menu as well. So we turn the zebras on, and this is for 41%. And so now, let me get this off so you can see, okay. And then I'm gonna adjust the lighting, which I'm doing with a remote control. I have one key light, that's the only light that I have for this here. And as I raise up the exposure by adding more light, you can see the zebras start coming over the gray card. So something like that, that will give me 41% exposure uh, on the gray card and that'll be perfect. So what I'm gonna do now is I'll hop around here and show you what that looks like. So as I take off this gray card and sit down here, one thing I wanna point out is that you always wanna get your lighting, white balance and exposure set up properly for where your subject's gonna be. That's why I have it set up right here. Hop in frame and We'll take this image into the computer and grade it. Now that we know how to properly expose an image, let's talk about color grading. Now, this is probably more color correction than color grading. Color correction is basically fixing any colors, adjusting exposure, stuff like that. Color grading is where you start to put more of an artistic feel to the image, but there's always a little bit of both going on. So <laughs> I'm just gonna say, I'll probably use those terms interchangeably and I apologize for that. Now, I also wanna say, like I did earlier, that there's no right way to do any of this stuff. There's a lot of different approaches here and probably a lot of you watching this are gonna think I'm doing this completely wrong. That's totally fine. What matters is the image at the end. There are lots of approaches. In addition to that, I don't use LUTs regularly and there's nothing wrong with using LUTs, but you need to understand how they work and find ones that work for you. Now, I'm, maybe I just don't use LUTs because I'm always shooting on different cameras and I've come to just grade everything by hand. Now, a lot of times this does take a lot more time. So if there's a shot that I'm using over and over again, like in my studio, I'll save it as a preset and then I can just apply it every time I shoot with that camera in that situation. Now, I'm gonna be editing in Final Cut Pro because that's the editor that I use. And that's not to say that Final Cut is better than DaVinci or Premiere. Uh, and a lot of the things that I will show you in this, you could actually use in either of those two pieces of software because I'm gonna be doing some really basic things. Now the goal here is just to show you how to bring the footage in, take a look at the log footage, see what's going on, learn how to use the scopes a little bit, and learn how to get comfortable with just adding some contrast and saturation and some basic corrections. So let's get started. All right, so we got our two clips over here in Final Cut. And let me give you a little tour around here if you haven't done any color correction or grading before. Essentially, we're gonna be using the color wheels over here, and you can also use color curves. There's a lot of ways that you can do all this adjusting, but I find the wheels to be the best for me and also the most simple. And so a little tour here, the global is gonna allow you to change everything in the image. So the adjustment on the right is gonna change the overall exposure up and down, so that's everything. And if you double click on it, it will reset it. Over on the left-hand side of this wheel is going to be the saturation level for the whole image. So adding saturation to the whole image. And then in the middle here is what'll push the colors around. And we're not really gonna do, be doing much of that in this uh, video. We're just gonna do some basic correction. So you have the highlights, which is the brightest parts of the image. You have the mid-tones, the middle, and then the shadows are the darkest parts. And again, you have the exposure and saturation and color for each one of those. And so this is basically what we're gonna be doing here. And then the other part is going to be the scopes over here. So there are a lot of different options. I personally like the RGB parade in the waveform, but 
Some people have preferences to use the RGB overlay. There's a lot of different options here, but I like RGB Parade. It's kind of what I've gotten used to. You have the red, green, and blue channel. And then what you're seeing here for each red, green, and blue is the exposure from left to right. So if there's something that's really bright on the image and you see a peak, you'll see that uh, roughly from left to right where it is. So this is the RGB Parade. This is what we're gonna be using. Now for the situation here, we're shooting outside, which has a lot of dynamic range. And so I'm probably gonna um, bring the highlights up to 100 and the shadows down to zero. You've probably heard this before. Now that's not always the case with every situation because not every situation has bright highlights and dark shadows. Some have, you know, like if I'm shooting inside here, I probably don't wanna just bring everything up to 100 because I don't want everything to be exposed at 100%. So it really depends on the situation that you're grading. And one mistake that I made early on with color grading was was that I tried to make everything look the same no matter what situation it's in. Keep in mind if you're shooting at night or if you're shooting uh, in a studio or if you're shooting when it's cloudy or when it's sunny, the image is gonna look different and so you don't always wanna force the same amount of contrast and saturation. So again, this kind of stuff is really subjective and by feel. And so again, it's the image at the end that really matters. Okay, so taking a look at our image here. So what I wanna do is I probably want to bring the highlights up and bring the shadows down. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to drag the exposure for the highlights and watching my scopes, drag this up to right near 100. And so that way I don't clip any of the highlights, all of the brightest parts of the image that you see along the top here, these are all hitting just around 100. Sometimes you can push it a little bit above 100 if you need to, but I generally try to keep it there, especially on these cameras, they have so much dynamic range. Okay, and so the shadows, I'm gonna bring these down to, you know, where you get close to zero for the darkest parts of the image. And so you see that over here, and we're not going below zero because if I do bring this down below zero, we'll start to lose information, like I'm, I'm being very extreme here, but you can start to see you're losing information in the shadows here. And I wanna keep all that information because we wanna use all the dynamic range that we have. So again, keep this right around uh, zero. And so right now, I this by doing that, by raising the highlights and lowering the shadows, I can turn this on and off. This is without that those corrections. You can see we added some contrast. Contrast is you know the difference between the light and the dark in that ratio. So the you know if you have a, a higher ratio of light to dark, you have more contrast in there. And so we by doing this, we just you know this was out of the camera. Now we have contrast. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add some saturation. And again, you can add them independently and you will do that as you get more familiar with all this stuff. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna raise the saturation for the entire image and play with this. And so one thing I have to say is when I first got started, I was adding way too much saturation. So just be careful with that. You want it to kind of look natural. And then lastly, I'm gonna play with the midtones here to just adjust sort of the overall look of the image. And so I'm just gonna drag it down a little bit and you can see what's going on here, making it a little bit punchier, and it gives the colors just a little bit more of a pop, make them look a little richer. And then I can see the shadows dip down a little bit below zero, so I'm just gonna bring this up a little bit. And a lot of times when you adjust one thing, you're gonna have to start tweaking the other things because everything kind of relates and, and moves everything else around. And the highlights are a little bit high, so I'm gonna bring that down. And I'm just gonna tweak it here. I'll probably bring the midtones down a little bit more, depending on the look you're going for. I like a sort of more contrasty, punchy image and then take a look at the saturation. And there you go. That's basically corrected. And I don't know, it's really to taste at this point. You can try to make it look a little punchier, a little more contrasty, you can change the colors. But I just wanna show you what it looks like coming out of the camera. This is what it comes, looks like, SLOG3 coming out of the camera. And this is after a very basic correction. You saw how quick that was. So anyways, <laughs> that's an outdoor example. And again, remember that we we're just not clipping the highlights. If we did clip the highlights, we would have seen flat parts of the um, the highlights on the top, they would have they been like a shelf there. Okay, uh, and I have to say that I just picked a clip here, but when we go to the next section, which was that indoor uh, talking head bit, which I wanna start grading now too, is when you go to grade a clip, you always wanna pick one um, frame that's sort of representative of the entire image. And you know, for these, it's not changing, but just pick one clip that you wanna grade. So we'll start with this one where I look like a deer in headlights, that's fine, let's use this one. Okay, so taking a look here, and so this was a very simple shot, like you saw, just one key light. Um, we're gonna grade this. And so this one is a situation where I am not going to drag the highlights up to 100 because in this shot here, there really isn't anything super bright. So what I wanna do here, is there's this line here, which you can drag up and down. And I set this to around 70. 
I usually shoot for my skin tones between 65 and 70 IRE. That's my skin tones. If you have darker skin, then probably a little bit darker. This is why this stuff is so subjective and just how it looks, but I'm gonna shoot for around 70. So what I'm gonna do here is basically the brightest parts of the image here are going to be me, my skin and stuff like that. So I'm gonna bring this up to around 70 or so. And then I'm gonna bring the shadows, which the darkest parts of the image is gonna be this spot here, which you see is probably this uh, table uh, leg right here is gonna be the, the darkest parts of the image. And so I'm gonna drag these down to close to zero because it's basically black. And so you can see, this is out of the camera. We just add a little bit of contrast. And then I'm gonna add some saturation, like I did before in the outdoor example. And then adjust the midtones down a little bit. So as I said before, we're just gonna be tweaking things a little bit. You can see that my skin tones and stuff came down. So I'm gonna bring that up a little bit. And then again, play maybe a little bit more down with the midtones, make it a little punchier. Take a look at the contrast. I mean, sorry, the saturation. What do you guys think? <laughs> Again, this is a super quick grade. And so uh, we could turn it on and off. This is out of the camera. And this is with that quick correction. So looks pretty decent. A lot of stuff you can do here. But one thing I wanna talk about a little bit is skin tones because that's usually one of the most important things with any image is getting the skin tones correct. So if we go over to the scopes over here and we select the vector scope, what this gives you is, you can use this for a bunch of different things. And the one thing I wanna talk about here is skin tones. And so this line right here represents skin tones and you wanna make sure your skin tones in the vector scope lie on that line. So what we can do here is this is the whole image. So you can mask it out. But one thing I do is I go over here and I go to the transform tools and basically I just jack up the uh, scale up to 400 or more. And then I have the transform selected here. So I'm just gonna drag this over my face. Sorry, I gotta look at my face so up and close. <laughs> uh, but you can see here that the skin um, on the vector scope is pretty much on the line. It's pushing a little bit towards magenta, which I'm actually okay with, but this is to your liking. And so one thing you can do if you have a small correction to make with skin tones is you can just drag the midtones so if I wanna bring this a little bit more towards green, obviously I can overdo it, make it really green, overdo it, make it more magenta. Again, double click to reset it. We can maybe just tweak this a little bit more towards green, but if I reset it, it looks pretty good anyways. I'd say we're pretty good anyways, and I think a lot of the reason for that was the fact that we did that custom white balance. All right, so to reset this, we go back here, and we, we're just gonna click over here and reset the transform. And there you go. So overall, I, I think you shouldn't be too scared of bringing your images in. And the biggest help for you to, in terms of color correction, color grading, is getting it as close as possible in the camera. So getting the exposure right, getting the white balance close, you don't have to do a lot of that stuff in the computer. So overall, pretty simple, <laughs> just getting started. There's a, you, can, you can nerd out forever on color grading and add your own looks and all that kind of stuff but I just wanna show you how easy it is to just get started and get comfortable working with S-Log3 footage. Well, I definitely recommend that you shoot an S-Log3 for most situations because you'll be getting the maximum dynamic range out of your camera. Now, if you're just getting into this, please practice exposing and grading images and do this on your own time. Don't take your camera out shooting an S-Log3 to a gig or an event where you can't reshoot it. I don't want you to you know, mess up any footage. So definitely practice. It takes a long time, but here's some basic, basics for you to get started. If you found this video helpful, I would really appreciate you hitting subscribe down below. It would really mean a lot to me. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.